Welcome. So as Sarah Jane said, I'm Anne Laflamme and I am an immunologist and I study multiple sclerosis. But what has been kind of the common theme throughout uh, my career has been my interest in how the immune system works, how it turns itself on, how it turns itself off, and you know, how we can do something about it. And in particular, I'm interested in how that relates to the immune system in MS, because for some reason, the immune system takes it upon itself to determine that one protein that you can find in the brain or in the central nervous system is a problem and attacks it. And that leads to a, a lot of downstream consequences of having the immune system targeting the wrong thing. Now the process of immune cells um, getting into the, the brain we can call neuroinflammation. So inflammation occurring within that area. And I thought that's what I'll talk about today because it lets me um, kind of celebrate the immune system in a, in a way, <laughs> but also just to really look at that process and how we tend to think of neuroinflammation as bad, but there are two sides to that. And so in fact, what we'll talk about are the wanted and unwanted family visitors, meaning the immune cells that are that brought into the brain or reside in the brain that have a protective function. And those that get in there and you really wish they hadn't come, those are the family visitors yeah, you, you want to get rid of. And you want to figure out strategies to keep them out in some way. And so we'll, um, I'll cover kind of how that process relates to multiple sclerosis. Okay, here we go. So when you start thinking about immune cells and immune cells getting into your brain, you know, not every immune cell there is bad. Okay, so if you start onto the left side of the screen here, I'll use a pointer nice laser pointer. In fact, you will find immune cells trafficking through your brain even when you're healthy. This is a process of surveillance, assassination, you know, so that immune cells traffic everywhere throughout your body. And some do go through your brain, especially you can have a specific type of of cell, the cytotoxic or that killer T cell can go and it often will um, pass through looking for viruses that it recognizes, looking for pathogens it's already seen that might be hidden there. So it's a level of surveillance, surveillance that happens. But there's also surveillance to look for cancer cells, which occurs again throughout your life. You have cells that are you know, immune cells that are looking for something that shouldn't be there. And that's a normal process. If it's found a cancerous cell or a, a virally infected cell, that cell can be killed in a quiet manner. Everyone's happy. But you can also have immune cells coming in because there's local damage. And one process of the immune system is not solely to you know, kill pathogens and you know, create havoc. It's also to clean up when there's been havoc or even when there has been a normal um, kind of turnover of cells. So there's always that cleanup and repair that's going to happen. That is an ongoing process, in which case you need both resident cells within the, immune, the uh, brain, such as your microglia. And these are cells that can pick up and scavenge and can help repair. But then you can also have infiltrating cells get, get called in if there's local damage um, to help with that process. And we know that process is even important in pruning and plasticity and it plays a, a, an incredibly important role in how your immune, uh, your brain develops and uh, continues to remain healthy. But then, 
On the other side, we have times when the immune cells get in there that may have started out as being a good thing. Say there was a, a bacterial pathogen there, a viral pathogen there, and that's good. You want the immune cells there to try to control that pathogen, but sometimes it gets out of hand. And as you say, you just can't stop the party. And that can lead to, again, um, serious consequences. A good example with uh, a viral meningitis is say dengue fever. Uh, the dengue virus uh, can in some cases cause that serious meningitis or inflammation in the brain. And it's that immune system not able to control itself gets out of hand and can cause damage. Both the bacterial or viral meningitis, that's really a very acute thing. You can also have it in a more chronic, chronic process. And it's now believed that a lot of the processes in Alzheimer's in particular are occurring because that reparatory process, the reparative process over time gets out of hand and doesn't work properly at the end, and you can accumulate that damage, accumulate problems. And that has to do with not stopping what you've started, not resolving that immune response or that chronic inflammation. Okay. So the last area we're gonna think about is meaningless destruction. And this is something that you see in multiple sclerosis. It's the riot that shouldn't have happened. It's where the immune system is now coming in because it, is, it has somehow convinced itself that one specific protein that you find in the brain, which is one of the myelin proteins, is dangerous. And by being dangerous, it will attack the cells that express that protein. And that can then lead to all of the symptoms of MS. So that neuroinflammation leads to a process called demyelination because the myelin is the protein or the, the myelin proteins are the target of the immune system so that you can demyelinate. And what you really want to do is try to remyelinate and repair. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at what is happening in MS such that you have that riot and what that riot is doing. And we'll look at that process and the process of how immune cells get in. And we'll also look at some of the treatments that are targeting the immune system. Okay, well, let's think about how cells get in, right? Do they all take the same pathway or are there specific routes that they need to use? Well, there are, surprise, surprise, very specific routes for cells to get into the brain from the blood. So immune systems enter tissue always from the blood. And there are pathways that are devised for cells to normally traffic through everyday trafficking. And one of the key ones is through the cord plexus. Now this, is a really interesting part of the brain. It's a really interesting tissue. So if you look in the brain in this pink area, you can see this is the part that's called the chorded plexus. And it's an area where there are blood vessels that go through, and then the cells that leave the blood have to go through a layer of epithelial cells, kind of like skin cells almost there, but they have to go through that and they'll get into the cerebrospinal fluid. So they get into the ventricles. And from there, they can traffic through as they need to. They can leave through the lymphatics and return back to the blood. So it's a nice process by which they can traffic through. They can look to detect if there's something that's wrong, there's pathogen hiding out, or there's damage to clean up. There's, there's a lot of... Um, it's a nice, uh, simple process for them that's well-regulated because this is absolutely regulated. It is not every cell that can leave the blood and go in 
um, through the choroid plexus. There are very strict signals that allow that entrance to happen. So in healthy individuals, this will be one of the prime mechanisms for cells to get into the brain. And now I keep saying the brain, but really I'm talking about the central nervous system or the CNS. So not only the brain, the optic nerve and the spinal cord, and all are a part of that central nervous system and will be um, have similar regulation of cells entering in, um, especially during health. Now, when there is urgent need for cells to be attracted in to the brain, when they are called in, basically, then they will go and they'll leave the blood through the blood-brain barrier. So if you look, you can see that the brain is very well serviced by the bloodstream. And cells can leave those blood vessels and they leave through the blood-brain barrier. This is a really difficult place to get through. It's kind of, you know, when you think about the border between the US and Canada or, um, yeah, US and Canada, Mexico and the US, any of those borders, land borders. And, you know, there are all these layers that you have to go through, you know, and that's very similar here. It's not easy to get out. In fact, when you look at the blood, you have endothelial cells. So these are your blood vessel uh, cells. So they're the cells right on the walls. They have these firm junctions. So cells not only have to try to get through there, before even that, they have to actually adhere to the endothelial wall because the blood is rushing past so fast that they adhere to it. And then they get the signals that allow them to kind of pass through those cells. Once there, they're not in the brain yet. They're in this perivascular space. So it's peri meaning around, so it's around the blood vessel. Once there, they need to now get through another layer into the parenchyma or the tissue of the brain. And that area is regulated by parasite, the parasites, the astrocytes, all of these are creating this barrier for cells. However, when there has been that call to arms to bring cells in, those, um, those signals will enable those cells to pass through. So when there are no signals, cells do not pass through this process, the blood-brain barrier. They'll pass through the other more regulated spaces. When there is, say, a, a bacterial or viral infection in the brain, the gates are open and the cells can pass in. Now they don't pass in absolutely everywhere that's often very localized and is relating to exactly and precisely where the damage or the infection is. Okay. So if we've covered immune cells, if they're getting in there, it's regulated. And it's really hard unless there's that those signals that really drive them in. Okay. So how does that relate to MS? And what is happening in multiple sclerosis? Well, what we know about is that there is an underlying autoimmune response, meaning that the immune system has started to target uh, a specific protein. And this is a myelin protein. And the cell that is targeting is a T cell. That T cell will recognize myelin and will direct other cells of the immune system to destroy any cell that expresses myelin. And while it is the T cells that provide the specificity, it's pretty much all of the other cells of the immune system that can do the dirty work and can cause problems. So where's myelin? Well, myelin is a protein that is found 
along the uh, on the membrane of oligodendrocytes, which are cells that provide kind of these the sheath uh, on the nerve axons. So what they really do is they take a, a little bit of their membrane and they just wrap it around the nerve axon. And so they form, again, those layers that insulate the nerve axon. So if this is a nerve cell, this is its axon with the idea that it has the synapses on these sides and it can talk to another nerve cell that's far away at the end of that axon. It can release those neurotransmitters, and send a signal. But for that signal, once that neuron decides to send this signal, it has to pass along that axon. And the speed of that really depends upon this myelination because that myelin insulates it and it enables it to pass efficiently and quickly. So in MS, there's destruction of that myelin sheath. And when that myelin sheath is lost, that signal transduction does not occur efficiently. It does not occur quickly. And that leads to the symptoms that um, occur with, with MS. There can be visual disturbances because of the optic nerve, mobility um, issues, cognitive impairment, fatigue, coordination. All of those can be um, affected depending upon which neurons have lost their myelin sheaths. So when lesions form in MS, they tend to form in very specific points. And for every person, it's different. And even over time in one person, those lesions can come and go. And so there, can, there are many different symptoms, many different things can happen, all depending upon where the lesions are at any one time. Now, when those lesions res resolve, so if, the immune system can turn itself off or turn itself down, there can be repair. So if the nerve axon is preserved, it can be remyelinated. However, that remyelination can be demyelinated again in another relapse. And so when you look at how MS progresses, you have um, the immune system coming in, causing an attack, causing that demyelination and therefore the symptoms. But the immune system does try to control itself. And when it does that, when it resolves, it repairs and you can go into remission. However, over time you can lose the ability to control uh, the immune system and you can also um, have impaired ability to repair and remyelinate and therefore have a progressive disease. So when you look at that, when you look at the major forms of MS, um, most people start with the relapsing remitting stage, which I was describing. And that's where you're having really a very high involvement of the immune system that is in the periphery, meaning outside of the central nervous system. Being outside of the central nervous system, there's that neuroinflammation that driving into the central nervous system, targeting the myelin that, and destroying the myelin and the oligodendrocytes, and then leading to the symptoms of MS. And you can see that demyelination is the stripping away of that protective layer. Now, over time, again, the immune system will uh, resolve itself. Repair can happen. Repair is a process that is very age dependent. And so as you get older, the slower that repair process becomes. But with the repair, you can remyelinate and go into remission. And so that's the relapsing remitting. 
However, about 50%, about half the people that start out with that relapsing remitting disease, again, that's 85%, most people start this way, but about 50% at some point will no longer experience those uh, uh, distinct attacks and remission. Instead, there's a more of a progressive accumulation of disability. And this is that secondary progressive stage. Some people also start out in this stage. And when you look at the progressive uh, MS, it looks more of a process of continuous damage and little to no repair. And this process is no longer really driven by peripheral immune cells coming in and driving the lesion development, but that slow burn, which causes that continuous damage and the impaired repair process. And once you've impaired that repair process, once you can no longer remyelinate, or if you don't remyelinate fast enough, you can have axonal loss. And it's that which is really leading to the progressive disability and that um, really long-term disability that is apparent in the progressive stage. So how do we treat this? Well, right now, I'm, when you look at the current treatments and the current treatments that are funded in New Zealand, it's really the immune system that you're targeting, really trying to get at that peripheral uh, immune invasion into the central nervous system and into the brain such that um, you, know, you can prevent the damage. So again, if you look at what's happening during MS with that neuroinflammation, remember this is coming primarily through the blood brain barrier. And if you look in the blood, you have immune cells um, passaging along, flowing along quickly. When there is the call to arms, when there is inflammation and those signals are sent, now the endothelial layer gets very sticky. And it's sticky only to those cells that are activated, okay? So it's not every cell that's gonna go there, but very specific ones. And in this case, it's going to be those myelin-specific T cells that then will bind to the endothelium and will be recruited in and get through into the parenchyma. And with those T cells, they can bring along monocytes, they can bring along B cells, other cells can be um, brought along as well. Because within MS, even though we talk about it being a T cell driven disease, and in particular a T helper cell driven disease, we know that every immune cell type plays a role at some point or can play a role uh, in MS. Okay, so if this is what's happening and this is the process we wanna target, how do we do it? And what therapies have we developed that target that process? So one of the most common uh, MS treatments in New Zealand and probably worldwide is Tysabri. And this is a monoclonal, monoclonal antibody. So it has a very specific target that this antibody binds to. And in fact, where it binds, is it binds uh, onto that endothelial layer. Um, actually, it binds onto the cells that want to go into the brain, especially those T cells that want to get into the brain. It binds kind of the, the marker or the protein on those cells that allows it to bind to the endothelium and get in. So it prevents that binding and it prevents them getting in. And by doing so, it just prevents that neuroinflammation. Now, one thing about that 
So this is preventing those cells that are activated T cells from binding and getting in. It is not MS specific. It is going to inhibit any of the immune cells, the lymphocytes from getting in and through this pathway. And so one of the um, drawbacks to Tysabri is that some people have a latent viral infection. So it's a virus that hides out and it can hide out in the central nervous system. And it's called the JC virus. And normally, even though it's latent, if it becomes activated, you have a circulating immune response which can go through and can or be called in and can control that viral infection. However, by um, inhibiting this process, that doesn't work as well as it should. And so it is not a common um, issue, but it is a potentially um, serious complication. And so for those who are on Tysapri, it's very important to assess whether or not you have um, an immune response, a known uh, uh, exposure to the JC virus. Uh, and, so, um, and so they'll look for uh, antibodies to that virus circulating around. And if, if you do that serological test, then, uh, and you have a, a high level of antibodies, then there are other treatments that would be better for you. And for some reason, it really seems to be that virus that's the key instigator here. And I'm not sure exactly why it's that one, but in this process, that's it. Now, another way to inhibit that um, migration of the cells from the blood into the central nervous system is by trapping them somewhere else. And that's what Galenia does. Galenia is, um, is not a monoclonal antibody. Galenia is a, a chemical, it's a compound that uh, basically interferes with the ability of cells or lymphocytes to leave lymph nodes. When you think about well, where, are where are lymph nodes, what are lymph nodes? Lymph nodes are kind of the meeting centers for your uh, immune cells, in particular for your B cells and your T cells. That's where they go to get activated. Everything starts in a lymph node and you have lymph nodes scattered throughout your body. And you usually know them when there is an immune response going on and they swell up a bit and they get hot and you're like, oh, that, that hurts. So, you know, you have them under here, under your arms, groins, behind your knees. All of these are areas and where you have this tissue, which is a lymph node, where your B and T cells get together. So they come in from the blood and then they should leave out through the lymphatics and then get back into the blood and they circulate around. Now the process of that cell actually leaving a lymph node, it needs very specific cues and it's galenia that interferes with those cues. And so it can trap uh, specific cells within the lymph node. So you'll have fewer cells in the blood that when activated will get into the brain. And so it just reduces that whole process. So one of the advantages of galenia is by being a compound, it is orally administered. Um, as opposed to Tysabri, which needs to be given through an infusion, uh, I think every month, month and a half. Okay, so those are all the anti-migration anti sort of processes. Let's look at other ones that target the cells involved and target by getting rid of them. Okay, so here's a, a previous. Acrevis is another monoclonal antibody like Tysabri. So it needs to be administered by infusion. And that infusion, I think 
for a previous is not as frequent as for Thais Sabre. I think it's yeah, I think it's more around once every six months, I believe. And don't quote me on that one, but I know it has a much longer duration. What does a crevice do? Well, a crevice is a monoclonal antibody that binds to a molecule called CD20. CD20 you find on B cells. B cells are the cells that produce antibodies. And turns out, Getting rid of B cells, which is what a crevice does, is really quite effective at reducing those relapses in MS. And that was, I think, a surprise. There were many people that didn't believe that for a long period of time because I think for years, decades almost, everyone was convinced it was all about the T cell. No, turns out, it's also about the B cell. And this is clear evidence. B cells are involved. Exactly how they're involved is still being worked out and how, how this works. But with a crevice, by depleting the B cells, seems to reduce those relapses and preventing that uh, inflammatory process and the invasion of cells into the brain. Along that line, we have Obagio, which, like a crevice, is targeting the cells that are causing the issues and depleting them in some way. But Obagio is a chemical, it's a compound that ends up interfering with the lymphocytes and depleting lymphocytes, so your B cells and your T cells. So it's pretty much getting rid of them or reducing them um, so that they will not drive the disease process. So the last one I have in line is Tecfidera. And Tecfidera is kind of quite different from the, the strategies that target the migration or the strategies that get rid of the cells. These, th this is a good example of an immune modifier. So what it does is it doesn't deplete cells, doesn't stop a process, it just changes the flavor. So now somehow Tecfidera convinces your lymphocytes in particular that they no longer want to go into the brain. <laughs> doesn't mean that they are, those cells are not there, doesn't mean that they are not antigen specific, meaning could target myelin, but they now no longer traffic in to the brain. That blood brain barrier is closed and is, um, you know, doesn't have the cells trafficking through it. So it's, it's quite interesting. Again, while it works, exactly how the precise molecular pathways, we don't understand. All we know is it is modulated the immune system such that it is no longer driving that neuroinflammation. And really, it's one of the key things to remember is that for this process of neuroinflammation, when you have the peripheral cells driving in, there are two really important components. One is you have to have those immune cells that are targeting myelin to cause the damage, but even having them won't do it because it's the second thing that's really important is you somehow have to get them into the brain. So there's something that is driving and calling them in as well. Okay, and so these processes that prevent migration don't stop the autoimmune process. They just prevent the damage that process could cause by preventing the cells from getting in. Okay. And then I guess Tecfidera is the other one. You, you just convince the cells to do something else. Very interesting. Okay, so those are 
the treatments that are available here in New Zealand, and those are um, the majority of the, the treatments that are around. Some of the older ones I haven't covered. I haven't covered glutamic acetate, the interferon betas, all of those kind of fall into that immunomodulatory area. And there are a couple others that have not yet or yeah, have not been approved. But those are kind of the main strategies in any case. So where are we going now? Okay, well, if we know that that infiltration of cells into the brain is causing a problem, those immune targeting strategies can prevent that immune damage. But it, does, it doesn't help repair any damage that was created. And it doesn't always fully prevent all damage. So, if, so that it's that damage that we now want to target. So where kind of the future for treatments go is in two different areas. First is in remyelination. So in the process of demyelinating the, ax the nerve axon, can we enhance the remyelination so that it happens very quickly and very effectively and efficiently? And we get that myelin coverage back to a healthy. And in particular, I guess what's important about that is to remember that that process of remyelination, that process of repair, um, your capacity for it decreases as you age. And so the need to enhance it, to bring it up and, and to um, enhance that process is great. And it's greater as you get older. The other aspect is thinking about neuroprotection. So trying to preserve that nerve axon and the, you know, even in the face of the period of demyelination or looking at ways to regenerate any nerve axons that were lost or um, nerve cells that were lost, that neuroprotection. So I will focus a, just a little bit on that remyelination but both of those are as essential. And really that's where most of the work is focused now. It's not so much on trying to uh, target the immune system. I think we've got some really uh, fantastic treatments in that arm. Now it's thinking about how do you repair? How do you remyelinate? How do you protect? And with, with that, if we just had protection alone, it would mean we would still have continuous damage, but we'd be repairing it. That's a pretty expensive process. So in fact, we really need to use all strategies together to really um, provide the best repair, best remyelination and in inhibition of damage. So really to get the best result. So in the area of remyelination, this is one area where I worked on recently uh, and just actually published a paper at the beginning of this year, which was looking at a strategy to enhance remyelination. And that was using a, uh, a repurposed agent, which is called nalfurafine. And so this was published, and I say, this is the work of a lot of people not just me, um, and I've had uh, two really excellent collaborators in this whole space. And we've been working in, in this space to not only investigate now furafine, but investigate other agents that target that specific receptor system, this um, pathway that is connected to remyelination. And so this was really one of the, the first um, uh, discovery of this agent in this process and exactly how well it worked. So for this, we use animal models and we use an animal model that looks at um, kind of the disability, the accumulated disability over time. And we induce an MS-like disease and you can see that that 
disability is normally sustained. But nalfurafine um, enhances the recovery when we treat therapeutically. So we treat after the onset. And it leads to, in fact, um, almost full recovery of these animals, which is fantastic. Um, and we connected that really to its ability to remyelinate. So when you look in the spinal cord, you can see that there are no longer patches of demyelination, um, meaning again, that there is the loss of axons, there is the loss of transmission by axons that have been retained in that area. And so this is an exciting new area that we've been working on. And we have been hoping, hoping to get a clinical trial running to investigate um, the effectiveness of this pathway uh, for remyelination in humans. Uh, that process is always a very long process because it involves raising money and getting all of that together. And we haven't quite gotten there yet. And I have received some emails. I have not answered them yet. And I'm very apologetic actually. Um, but we're still in that process of trying to get that going. And we do not know yet whether or not this particular agent would be um, useful in humans or not. Um, and certainly we don't know the dose yet for that. Um, but this process or this pathway, um, we believe is really fantastic pathway to target and would be really, yeah, really exciting area to develop. And while we know this pathway is involved, I'll say there are several others as well that researchers internationally are investigating. There are a variety of different ones. So as you know, if you're driving to the airport, there's not only one way to go. There are many ways to go to the airport. And it's the same with this repair process, this remyelination process. There are many ways to target it, to enhance it, and to potentially provide that benefit for MS. And I really think within the next five years, there should be something available to help in the remyelination space. It is a very, very um, hotly researched area right now. So I have to say, as I said, thank you to everybody who has worked on this with me uh, and those who have funded all of this work. Um, I will highlight, in fact, um, my key collaborators, Bronwyn Connor and Thomas Prisanzano. So Bronwyn is here at Victoria University of Wellington with me and Tom is at the University of Kentucky. And I have a very friendly and happy lab group uh, and work together with uh, Bronwyn's group. And thank you to the Neurological Foundation who have been incredibly important in getting a lot of this research started. They are willing to take risks on projects and just see whether or not those are good ideas. And so they'll invest really early. And that's fantastic. It's something that is sometimes very difficult to get. When you have a good idea, you can't get the little bit of money that gets you somewhere. And so thank you to the Neurological Foundation and to um, the other funders of this work.